Thank you, Sonia. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. I said last Sunday that <clears throat> I am looking forward to getting to know each of you. Would love to get together with each of you for coffee or at your home or whatever over the next number of weeks and months. I would love to hear your story. Hear what God is doing in your life. Hear what you're excited about, what you're nervous about. I also want to say that I just uh, I appreciate your graciousness as we all adjust to things moving forward. I mean, you bring in a new guy and inevitably there's tweaks and changes and things that uh, are adjust. I'm some, some of the things that we do, of course, are new to me and I'm not supposed to, sure if I'm supposed to face this way or face that way or <laughs> what I'm supposed to do. So thank you for uh, adjusting along and being gracious with all of that. And I also want to say my door is always open. So if you have any thoughts or comments or anything you want me to know, shoot me a note or give me a ring or knock on my door. I would love to, to visit about that. All of that is helpful. So <clears throat> thank you for that. But as I want to hear your stories, I thought, well, probably it would be helpful if you heard my story. So I want to try and give you my, the story of my spiritual journey in about 20 minutes this morning, or at least hit some of the highlights, okay? I was born and raised in Western Canada in, in a wonderful, loving Christian family. I always say that I never doubted God's love for me because I never doubted my parents' love for me. And that my life has been such that I like to quip a couple things about my life. One, I say that I ought to be godly like Bill Gates' kids ought to be rich. <laughs> Not that I am godly, but I ought to be, okay? Second, I say that I find my life to be an attempt to answer the question, what am I to do with all with which I've been blessed? And hopefully I've been answering that question as I go along, and hopefully our participation here is, is part of the answer to that question. But, but I grew up in a conservative evangelical tradition, and I want to talk about that tradition for a little bit. And maybe some of you are familiar and your experience is, is like that, and, and I hope that what I say will be helpful and encouraging to you and will give you something to think about. Okay, but I want to say first that while I want to reflect on that tradition and, and even poke and prod a little bit at some of the things that I was taught or some of the things that happened within that tradition, I also want to say that I have great love and respect for all the people that were influential in my life growing up. And that all of us, we are, are doing our best to follow God and, and understand things and navigate life. None of us are doing it exactly right. They weren't doing it exactly right. I'm not doing it exactly right. And so while I, I want to poke and prod a little bit, I just have great love and respect for all those, those people. But this conservative evangelical tradition that I was brought up in, the overarching goal, the overarching purpose... Uh, within that system of life was one to accept Jesus as your savior and then two to get other people to accept Jesus as their savior and in so doing you would by accepting Jesus as your savior you would cross a line of faith so that then you could be assured that when you died you went to heaven and people that didn't accept Jesus as their savior in the right way well then they would end up when they died, going to a place of torment called hell. And this was just the overarching narrative. Anything, everything else we did was secondary to this narrative, to this purpose. And it expressed itself such that if people told uh, you their story or shared with you their testimony, the first thing they would talk about would be their conversion experience. Or the moment that they accepted Jesus as their Savior or asked Jesus into their heart. That was, the, that was the language that we used. And for me, that was November 18th, 1984. If you had a date, that was a great thing. And it served as an aid to faith, something you look back on. November 18th, 1984, on that Sunday morning, the pastor preached a sermon in which he said that maybe some people think they're saved, but maybe they're not actually saved. Or... Uh, maybe somebody thinks that they've accepted Jesus as their Savior, but maybe they actually haven't. 
And I, as an eight-year-old, I had thought that I had accepted Jesus when I was five, but the pastor sowed seeds of doubt in my mind that morning. And so that evening, I uh, went to, during the evening service at our church, I went to a back room in the church with my mom where I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior. And I remember crying and, and praying, and, and, and that was a significant uh, moment in my life. But I don't remember anything I said during that prayer except for one line, and it was this, I do so want to go to heaven. And while that moment has been significant in my life and, and has been an aid to faith for me, as I reflect back on it, I think to myself, here's an eight-year-old boy accepting Jesus as his Savior, m motivated by fear, by fear of not going to heaven, and more than that, fear of going to hell, right? And I think to myself, surely this is not what Jesus meant when he said, let the little children come to me. But, but that began kind of a spiritual journey for me <clears throat> and, and was significant for me. I have said that since that moment in 1984, I never doubted my salvation. I never doubted that, that I was saved until I went to seminary. And then a serious examination of your faith, right, raises more questions than it does provide answers, and I think that's a good thing. <clears throat> and I started to, to think about and, and uh, in a significant way, ask some questions that I'd not before asked. Now, there were a number of moments in my spiritual journey that began to point me to think that I think God's salvation is more universal. And, and began to challenge some of these things that I'd learned within this evangelical tradition, this idea that some people are in and most people are out and somehow I was in, you know. But one of those moments that was significant for me that really was a, a, a turning point in my journey was five years ago in, in the fall of 2013, I attended my uncle's funeral uh, up in Canada. And my uncle had some challenges in his life. And he had a son when he was 60. And the mother was not at all involved in, in things. My uncle lived in the small little town that he was raised in. And he was a very passive person, not at all domineering. And so his son just kind of ran around the community and was kind of raised by the community. It takes a village, right? And, and my uncle didn't know where he was all the time. And, but people would find him and just send him home. And, and that was just the way it was. And then my uncle died when he was 74. And so my cousin was 14 when my uncle died. And, and uh, I was up there for the, for the funeral. His only significant, his only immediate family member, his only significant family member in his life, and really the future, his future without his dad was, there was some sort of plan, but it was kind of ambiguous and didn't work out very well. Of course, my parents were involved in that or whatever. But I remember saying to my dad that weekend of my uncle's funeral, I said, you know, still being within this tradition, I said, if you put my back to a wall, I'd admit to being a universalist. That is, believing that God ultimately is going to redeem everybody. You know, that in a sense, you know, to use the language within that tradition, that everybody goes to heaven eventually, right? I said, because, I mean, here I am. I said, I have received, I mean, growing up, every emotional and spiritual and, and material advantage. I mean, I grew up with every opportunity to know the love of the Lord and to receive Jesus as my Savior and all those things. And my cousin, I mean, compared to the opportunity that I had, he had no opportunity, right? I'm not, not saying anything about my uncle or the wonderful people in that, in that community, but compared to the opportunity that I had, he had none. And, and his future is ultimately uncertain without the support of a family structure around him. And I don't know what happens to him, but I just cannot believe that if he doesn't accept Jesus in the right way, that God's going to send him to hell for all eternity. I just, I can't believe it. And so that began me on a process of, of study in a specific way, uh, examining this idea that God is going to ultimately save everybody, right? If you want to call that universalism, whatever you want to call it. And I began to see things that I'd never seen before. And I began to ask questions I'd never asked before. And I began to look at the scripture in a different way. 
all of us are wearing a set of lenses. All of us are wearing yeah, glasses through which we look at the scripture that influence the way we understand the scripture. All of us are wearing glasses. And if you put on certain glasses, certainly you can look at the scripture in a way that would say, hey, God's going to save a small few and ultimately most people are lost. But you can also, you can also put on glasses and you can find lots of verses that seem to suggest that, that Jesus' salvation is universal in scope. And I had, I had never seen those before. Certainly we didn't talk about them in this tradition, right? But 1 John 2.2 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, As in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. Colossians chapter 1 says that, he is the image of the invisible God, that is Jesus. By him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, thrones, powers, and earth. all things were created by him and for him. And God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. All things created by Jesus, all things reconciled through him. Romans chapter 5. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. Right? What, what Adam did that affected us all, Jesus undid and it affected us all. And my favorite one was Romans 3.23. Maybe some of you are familiar with that verse. In this tradition, we knew that verse because it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I heard many a preacher say, Hey, all have sinned and fall short. That's all of us. It doesn't say some of us have sinned. It says all of us have sinned, right? But I can't recall a single preacher ever including verse 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. But how had I not seen this, you know, before? And so I began to think about and write about and talk about some of these ideas with people outside of this tradition. I knew that within this tradition, I mean, it would not be fair for me to talk about it without you know, visiting with the church that I was a part of. And so I began to do that in a, in a significant way. And some night, if you're wide awake and you need something to put you to sleep, you can find all my writing at www.reallygoodnewsreally.com. Really, dude? There's some videos, so hopefully those will be a little more stimulating. But anyways, if you want to... Uh, you're welcome to do that. And, and yeah, I began to, to think about and wrestle through these things. And then I just, I was keeping it in the bag, of course, within this tradition, because I knew that at the point at which I kind of let the cat out of the bag, this tradition that is based on this overarching narrative of people in and people out, that possibly or even probably that was going to put me outside uh, that community. But eventually, after about two and a half years, I, I thought to myself, ah, my only motivation to keep it in the bag is a, a motivation of fear of what's going to happen in the future. And I thought that's not good motivation. So eventually I said to our, our senior pastor of the church I was a part of, hey, let's go for coffee. And we talked about some of these things. And, and that quickly led to my resignation uh, from that church. They asked for my resignation. I gave it willingly. It was kind of a mutual thing. Uh, my dad was on staff at the same church, and, and he and my mom left, and my sister and my sister and brother-in-law were involved there, and, you know, and they ended up leaving and whatever. And so it was a, it was a tough time. My parents have been so supportive, if I, if I can add a little levity, you know, to the moment. My dad says, you know, as, as he gets older, his theology just seems to go like this. You know, my dad says, uh, I told you about the movie Rudy a couple Sundays ago. My dad also likes to say that 
The, the, the theology he finds the most satisfying is the one articulated in the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, right? <laughs> How I wonder. So, but it was, it was certainly a difficult, difficult uh, you know, decision and move and all that. However, I want to say that while nothing happens perfectly, and certainly related to that whole situation, there was some hurt that we had to deal with. There was some forgiveness that we had to arrive at, all of that. Uh, I have said before, and I, and I say again, that I think in that whole scenario, by and large, everybody did their best to respond in the way that they believe God would have them respond within the system of belief that they're a part of. And so we continue to pray for and want the best for the ministry of that church that, that we were uh, a part of. And, and yet we are so glad to be on this journey and where God has brought us. Uh, we, we, are, we are grateful for that, you know, and it, today I just find myself, I'm just not worried about getting it all right, you know. I'm not worried about believing correctly. I'm not worried about dotting all my theological I's and crossing all my theological T's. I've, that God goes beyond the correctness of our ability to get it right, you know. That if Jesus understands what it's like to be us, you know, if Jesus put himself in our shoes, then Jesus understands what it's like to be me. And he, he understands what it's like to be my cousin, right? And that his love is everlasting. And nothing in all creation can separate us from his love. And so, I, I find myself today outside of this tradition, outside of the worry of am I in or am I out, and yet I find myself not wanting to follow Jesus less, but wanting to follow him more. But that movement, once I let the cat out of the bag, right, and we begin, I began to talk about it with people, there were two questions that were the most significantly asked questions, or the most frequently asked questions, related to this new idea to these people that God might ultimately save everybody. There were two questions that came up more than any other. And so next Sunday I want to talk about those questions. <laughs> and over the next number of weeks, I want to tell you why I continue to follow Jesus. But as you're here this morning, I want to say I believe God's love is everlasting. I believe nothing in all creation can separate you from his love. I believe you don't need to worry about getting it all right. Right? But I follow Jesus and I would encourage you to follow him too. And I believe that one day he's going to reconcile everybody to himself. So let's pray together. Father, again, we're just grateful that you are with us and that we... We know that not only are you with us, but you understand what it is to be us because of Jesus. And so we, God, we come to you with confidence, knowing that at you we will receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And God, we trust in your unfailing love for all of us. We believe that you love us all, that you desire for everyone to know and respond to your love that you desire to save everybody and that you are able to get it done. So, Father, we rejoice in that this morning. Thank you for each person here. Time to celebrate together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to sing together.